What is crackling, everybody? Welcome on into the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast, powered by Number Fire. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. As today, we are heading right on back to Weirfield Village for the second consecutive event at this course. This time, it is the Memorial Tournament, and it is a loaded field with Bryson DeChambeau, Tiger Woods, Justin Thomas, some guy named Rory McIlroy. Should be a pretty fun event for DFS as well. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com joined here as always by brandon gadula he is the managing editor for number fire brandon this is our final podcast together for like a decade because i go on vacation first and then you go on vacation so this is I, i'm already feeling like a separation anxiety how you doing well i mean it'll be nice you're probably ecstatic to, to boot me out of here for next week well look it'll it'll be nice uh I won't have to like deal with Jim's criticism of my clapping before the show. <laughs> I guess I guess we have to clap to sync up the audio and video yeah. or something. Yeah, it's so way we beyond that. me. And like I ask, I specifically ask Brandon to clap well because he gives these like weak claps that like barely register on my audio app, and it's just kind of like it it, it makes me like tense when you don't clap well. So I specifically ask you to clap well, and then you blatantly disregard my my command and you're like no uh, cal our video producer com- compared it to two knees clapping which i think is the most accurate description he possibly could have given it's terrible like try I mean, like if you put that on my tombstone that i couldn't clap i, <laughs> I mean i'm not gonna care like my hand, I care. even when i do that my hands thing so Just i think better. it might be i think it might be the mic because i clap pretty no, hard no it's maybe you I, it's you Operator error. It's terrible. Uh, I am well, sad I mean, that I, I won't be able to, like, push Emiliano Grillo on you um, <laughs> against your will for the next couple of weeks. Like, that that makes me sad personally. But, yeah, I mean, I, was, one last I, ride. I was feeling sad. And then you, you just made fun of me for the claps for the 50th week in a row. Justifiably. So, I mean, you know what? Maybe it's good. But, I wouldn't yeah, make I mean, fun of you if you clap better. I'm just going to, like, get some sort of device that I can just, like, make a noise with. They make clappers. Like yeah, maybe like, I'll get one. Those, like, things that you bring to, like, baseball stadiums and you, like, swing them together and they clap for you? As a uh, lazy I'm person, they are a dream stick. come true. Because I don't want to I don't want to clap myself. It's way too much effort. Those were a dream come true back when you could go to places with other people. Um, but, like, <laughs> I think I need to get you one of those. Yeah, maybe. But, I mean, it is going to be strange. Uh breaking down some of these fields you know solo um yep. it's always good to get some of my checks uh you know out there and have you tell me oh, why they're jim not likes walking good. neiman this week abandoned ship uh <laughs> jim is using sung jm trying to buy low again abandoned ship like it's you know it is a good check i agree although you know to be fair when Colin Morikawa started off hot last week, I was like, this is the most obvious thing ever. We know yeah. how good Morikawa is with the irons. He might yeah. be the best iron player in the world right now. And I was talking, don't put a lot of stock into these recent samples. Trust the longer term. Colin Morikawa sitting there just didn't really think about him enough. Yeah. So and that's on. You got off your Colin Morikawa bunga uh, tweet after he won. So we, we got that out of the way. But now... We're going back to Muirfield yet again. We're going to talk about that in a second. But also, I should mention, even though I am on vacation this next week and then Brandon's on vacation at that, we're still going to have a PGA podcast every week. It will just be different. Uh, A couple (laughs) solo pods in there. Brandon's going to call in from basically like Russia. I don't know. uh, Wherever you're going to be. Mount Hood, maybe. Mount Rainier at that point. I don't know. I have no idea. Anyway, you're going to be somewhere. You're going to call in, and we're going to talk golf. So you'll still get your takes off, but we'll still have a PGA podcast every week, Tuesday, here on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed. So make sure you're subscribed to that. Different format, uh, because it might be some solo shows, but we'll still get you your content here in the same feed. Uh, NASCAR podcast for the All-Star Race, which is Wednesday night, is already posted. And then a podcast for Texas, which is on Sunday, We'll go up Thursday. It's already been recorded, so sorry. Uh, I kind of had to get it out beforehand, but 
All those things are available in the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed, so make sure you are subscribed so you can hear Brandon and I bicker once we get back to that in the very near future. But first, let's talk about the Memorial, which is this weekend, again, at Weirfield Village Golf Club. It is 7,392 yards. It is a par 72, and the big saving grace, I would say, is that it is finally a smaller field. It's down to 135 golfers instead of 155. That's the good thing. The bad is that the 135 golfers here are all really good. That's scary. So although a higher percentage of golfers will make the cut, it's still going to be tough. Uh, So Brandon, when you look at this course, what are you focusing on statistically? And were there any big takeaways from last week? Yeah, so I mean, the difference in 20 players takes the cut from about 42% to 48% of the guys making it, which is still not half um and that's problematic uh i think if anything yes more golfers will make the cut so you can think that you can take more chances but really more of your opponent's lineups are going to have six of six make the cut uh probably not substantially so because it's still very difficult but it is still very very important to try to roster golfers who have realistic odds to make the cut and not punt too often so i'm keeping that uh in the front of my mind Last week at this course, uh, according to datagolf.com, 41% of the scoring uh, is explained by approach, which is obviously the most of any of the four strokes gain categories. I mean, 40% when there's only four options, uh, it's going to be number one. 32% came from putting, which is actually uh, less than usual. And just 11% of scoring was explained by strokes gained off the tee. I think that hurts a few golfers this week. Uh we can look at Bryson primarily for that. Although Bryson can club down, he can hit. He's been hitting fairways at about a field average rate, uh, which is insane for how much distance he has. But he can club down, so I don't think that that means don't play Bryson uh, this week. But with how thick the rough got last week, and it's going to continue to grow, we need accuracy off the tee. Uh, we need iron play to be pretty nice, uh, pretty pristine. Uh, We can't really have golfers getting into a lot of trouble. So I'm keeping my key stats pretty much the same as I had last week uh, because, I mean, tee to green performance uh, based on approach is just the most predictive way to play DFS golf. So I'm sticking with strokes gained approach, driving accuracy, strokes gained around the green just to get out of trouble, uh, bent grass putting, and birdie rate. Uh, yeah, so last week we were different because you were looking at accuracy, whereas I was looking at distance. I am changing this week, not to accuracy, but to stroke scene off the tee. Despite the fact that it didn't count for a lot of the scoring last week, the golfers who did well were golfers who were good off the tee coming into the event. If you look at uh, the top 20 golfers from last week and look at where they ranked on Fantasy National and various off the tee categories entering the event, the median rank for those top 20 golfers in distance was 60th. The median rank for accuracy was 79th, median rank for good drive rate was 58th, and the median rank for stroke screen off the tee was 40th. So stroke screen off the tee was easily the best uh, off the tee stat, which makes sense because it's just trying to gauge those things. Uh, so I did go stroke screen off the tee and then approach. Approach was actually a higher median uh, than off the tee. I'm not saying it's more important, obviously, because approach is always going to be more important. But it kind of shows that golfers who ranked well in strokes gained off the tee entering the event did really well during the event. So I'm going to go with strokes gained off the tee, strokes gained approach, uh, scrambling once again, given the weird nature of the uh, the roughs, and then bank grass putting. So again slightly different uh, stat categories here, but like we still wound up on kind of the same guys last week. So I'm not sure how much of a difference it'll wind up making at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, going through the player picks, um, your two high price studs were probably two of my first options. Um, so I think with it, we're not completely different. And regarding strokes gained off the team, not being like overly important last week, it it's usually around, I think 15 to 16% of scoring. Yeah. Because there's a lot more that goes into uh, converting uh, your final score on a hole than what you did off the tee. That being said, this week in this field, at a course this difficult, you need to gain strokes off the tee. Nobody's going to win this by being like decent or like bad off the tee. So whatever it is, I think you need basically your golfers to excel 
or not be terrible in all four categories. And that takes out a lot of the value plays because they all do at least one thing poorly. <laughs> and that's why they're priced there. And that's why they're not always in contention. So except I for think Brian that... Harmon. <laughs> Is he always in contention? Always in but, contention, man. Never missed a but, cut. Yeah. So the, I think that balance is, is the number one uh, way to approach this week. We talk about this for majors a lot too, but there is also more credence to going balanced when when you are using golfers in the 10,000 range who are still like world-class golfers. And that's the case this weekend because we've got Tiger Woods at 10-6. Maybe you're not into him, but you still have Brooks Kepka at 10-7, Xander Schauffele at 10-8, Hideki is 10-9. So even... Like, even when you are saving salary and going more balanced, you're still getting disgustingly good golfers. So I am on board with you where I want to go a bit more balanced. I love the upper 9,000 range this week. I think it is absurd how good that range is. So I'm on the same page as you. Normally, I push back on the balanced approach. I will not do that this week. Uh, before we take a look at the the history here at Muirfield, Brandon, I want to talk to you philosophically about how much stock you're putting into what we saw last week? Because it's the first time we've seen a double up event, and I think like 60 years or something. Are you going to move guys up a decent amount based on what they did last week? Or is this more so a spot where you may look to fade the golfers who blew up and try to buy low on some golfers who maybe didn't show that well? Um, I think ultimately I'm not putting much stock into it because it's a two to four round sample for these guys. And I've learned, especially with this restart, not to care too much. Um, I know that this is a special circumstance, but this is a very different field. And these, like you said at the top of the show, these are like all of the best golfers in the world. I don't think that there's any significant advantage from having played this uh, last week. And I don't think there's any significant disadvantage by not having played it. So realistically, um, I don't I, I actually thought I was going to come into this and say wh whoever wins is a fade. But it's really hard to hate Colin Morikawa based on what he does. It's not yeah. like he putted his way to a win. I mean, obviously, he you know made that clutch putt. But uh, we know that he's a great uh, ball striker and an elite iron player. So I was hoping to avoid... Um, the guys at the top of the leaderboard, but with Justin Thomas, Colin Morikawa, Victor Hovland being so good, Tita Green, I don't really see that. Maybe someone like Ian Poulter, who I actually recommended last week, he just putted a ton. I'm yeah. fine. Like If we see those types of players and profiles, someone who just putted a lot uh, to get near the top, I'm fine avoiding those, but I would probably avoid those anyway just because he was you know boosted by putting. I think the benefits of the golfers who did well last week is that – they're surrounded by good names. Like, in general, sure, we would expect the public to gravitate towards Colin Morikawa off a win, but will they gravitate to him over John Rahm, who is 11-4? I don't know. So, like, I think it kind of goes to what you're saying, because the big reason to fade a, a golfer who wins is under the assumption they'll be popular, but I don't think that's necessarily a correct assumption to make for this weekend, given how good the field is. So I think that I'm on board with you, where I'm not bumping those guys up, but I'm also not crossing them off because they did well this past weekend. There's some golfers who I think may have underperformed a bit this past weekend who I want to get at because I do think there's an advantage to having just seen this course. Uh, but I think that people will see those finishes and maybe be not as not as into them. And I think that's that's an intriguing spot for me, at least. We'll talk about some golfers here in just a bit. But first, the stars are all out for this week's Memorial Tournament. And FanDuel has big contests to match it. If you want a massive prize pool, check out the PGA Eagle Contest. It is just $9.99 to enter with $500,000 in total prizes and a $100,000 first place prize. If you want a more flat payout structure, which I know a lot of you do, check out the PGA Stinger. There, a $3 entry fee gets you a shot at $100,000 in total prizes. 10K to first. Top 20 finishers all get at least $100. Not a bad ROI for a $3 entry. So for more information, go to FanDuel.com or download the FanDuel app. Eligibility restrictions apply. Let's take a look at past history here at Muirfield, and some of this will revolve around last week. One golfer who was not in the field this past week was Tiger Woods. Not sure if you heard of him, but he's in the field this week. He is $10,600. First time we've seen Tiger in a while, while, Brandon, but it wasn't that long ago that Tiger Woods was winning tournaments once again here on the PGA Tour. What do you think about Woods here at 
It's a really reasonable price. Uh, I understand it because of the layoff, but he's in the field for the first time in a long time. Everyone's taking notice. And, of course, Muirfield's been <laughs> quite good to Woods in the past. Uh, 17 starts here, five wins in the Memorial, never missed a cut. Since 2012, he's made five starts. He won in 2012, was 65th in 2013, 71st in 2015, 23rd in 2018, and ninth last year in 2019. Despite two non-elite finishes in there, he's been pretty phenomenal statistically outside of that 2015 season when the form wasn't quite there overall. Uh, he's gained at least 4.9 approach strokes in four of the five starts, at least 7.4 strokes tee to green in three of them. When he finished 23rd here in 2018, he led the field in strokes gained tee to green, but lost 7.7 .7 strokes putting, which is not very typical, especially for someone as good as Tiger Woods with the putter. Uh, we just haven't seen a start from Tiger since the Genesis when he was 68th, and that was back in mid-February when he lost eight strokes putting. <laughs> but, like, I usually have been low on Tiger. I don't think I'm there anymore. I think that whenever Tiger plays, it's because he's healthy, he's focused, he's committed, and we have a lot of reason to believe that he will be for this event. So how are you handling the main attraction this week? Yeah, I think... I am okay taking a wait and see approach because we have a lot of, I, I know what you're saying is valid, but we have a lot of unknowns with Tiger given the long layoff, given the injuries. And I think that that is, is valid when we have so many good options around him and it's Tiger Woods. You know, he's going to be popular this week on FanDuel. So if we have unknowns combined with popularity, I am very okay taking another route and going to Xander Schauffele Xander's gotten a lot of buzz this week, too, so it's not like you're going to get Xander at, like, you know, 10% roster rate, but he'll be lesser, less popular than Woods. I think we can say that pretty definitively, so I'm kind of okay not going at Tiger this week. If it burns me, it burns me. It's burned me in the past, believe me. Um, it definitely has, not using Tiger, but I think for this week specifically, given how many good options we have and how many uncertainties there are around Tiger, I'm okay taking a more reserved approach and watching him this week, seeing how he does. And then if I have to buy high, I'll buy high. But I think I'm okay taking a more low key approach here. What about you? What are you doing with Tiger Woods this weekend? Um, I, it seems like I, I like him uh, much more than you do. Uh, the, the only problem is his draft percentage on FanDuel. Whenever we look at tournaments, Last week, only eight golfers were drafted on at least 20% of lineups. Patrick Cantlay at 41.85% was the only one above 28%. So I think in a field like this, we're going to see pretty flat draft percentages across the board, aside from maybe one or two golfers. And He's let's be honest. going to be one of those one or two. It, <laughs> yeah. So I think one like what you have to do is figure out how you can differentiate if you play Tiger. And I think this week, probably more than a lot of weeks, because it's like a major, you can differentiate very easily because we, right. we will understand closer to lineup lock, which of these studs is expected to just sort of fly under the radar. Even if it's, look, we don't play a lot of Brooks Kepka in DFS because you just never know what to expect. I know Brooks Kepka has called, he's, said he wants to be the casino or whatever, run the table, whatever it is, um, that response to Bryson, he he can win. And if people aren't playing Brooks, in a combination of Tiger and Brooks is automatically pretty much like a contrarian way to play it. I'm not saying Brooks will be under the radar, but we will find by Thursday morning which golfers aren't getting enough buzz. Tiger, Brooks can be unique. But Brooks Xander can be more unique if Xander is less popular than Tiger. So I think that's why I'm Justin, having hesitancy here. Justin Rose, Jason Day could be more unique than Tiger. No, but like if we're talking about, like I prefer Xander over Tiger straight up. Do you? Yeah. Xander um, will also yeah. be less popular than Tiger. Yeah. So why would I not just go Brooks Xander rather than Brooks Tiger? But you don't like Tiger as much as I do. I like Tiger plenty, but I'm okay avoiding him when I know he'll be on 45% of rosters. Is that fair? I would say... I'd 30. set the over-under at 43.5. I, 
I'd go a little bit under. Okay, you have the under. I'm taking the over. We're doing this is Just our first be- bet of the podcast. Okay. Well, we've got the over on 43 and a half on Tiger Woods roster rate. Let's say in uh, the Eagle contest, the big the big nine dollar ninety nine cent one. Okay. I'll pull a link for you, but yeah, I think uh, I think I'm gonna go over there. I think he he gets to forty five percent. I wouldn't be surprised, but I think that we have enough options where it might be closer to forty, which is still crazy high. Okay, we we shall see. We I don't think we've done a, a roster rate bet in a while. This is this is interesting. Usually mm-hmm. our bets are terrible. This one's kind of fun actually. Oh boy, we, I forgot to check. I had Munoz over. Grillo last week. Munoz, I'll talk about him, but he missed the cut. Uh, so did Grillo. Yeah. <laughs> Neither of them were Joel Damon, so hey, at least there's that. Uh, let's move on to another golfer who has had an interesting history. At, you won? Yeah, I mean, whatever. Uh, at Weirfield. But that's Mark Leishman. Mark Leishman is coming off a missed cut at this exact same course this past week, and he lost 1.7 strokes in approach. So it wasn't good. But I think he could fit the buy-low approach for this week. The big reasoning is that Leishman had good form prior to that. He gained at least 3.3 strokes in approach in six of his previous eight measured events. The approach play had been good, and he also has good history on this course outside of the missed cut this past week. He was fifth here last year. He was also fifth here in 2015. He had a top five in 20 or top 15 in 2016 and 2017. And Leishman's $9,500. It's a loaded range. I think that Leishman is one of the golfers who makes that tier loaded to me. And I think that he's pretty enticing if people are off of him due to the missed cut. Uh, Brandon, is Mark Leishman someone who stands out to you at $9,500? Um, so I don't know if he stands out, but he doesn't necessarily take away from that range. Okay. Um, obviously, 10th in approach over the past 50 rounds, which you probably said, but I didn't listen. I did not. No. Um, there you go. Okay. See, no, you, you totally have me. You listened well. The best listener. Okay, uh, he leads the PGA Tour, I think, it, this season in strokes gain approach, and he's like top ten in uh, adjusted strokes gain approach according to Data Golf's performance table, which is a very good uh, resource uh, to check out. So, I mean, he's not just doing that in weak fields. Um, I think that Leishman, along with other names in this range, just gives a lot of credence to a balanced lineup because this week we're getting. Golfers like Leishman, Sung J M at you know in the mid nine thousands, as opposed to Joel Damon at ninety three hundred. <laughs> like that's that's the kind of difference we're looking at. And I think that uh, Leishman, while I don't necessarily put him at the forefront of my mind this week, he's probably going to be in my roster just because I can load up on a ton of uh, golfers in this range. I think he's third in this tier to me, so I don't want to overstate my interest. Um, but the only reason he's third is because the two guys ahead of him are, like, two of my favorite golfers in the entire field. Uh, Paul Casey and Joaquin Neiman, I think, are just dynamite plays. So I'm going to put Leishman third in this tier, but that's not a poor reflection of him. It's a good reflection of how disgusting this tier is on FanDuel. So, although so Leishman... Leishman over Sungjae. Yes, I do. I, I wouldn't go there. Okay. Um, I think Sungjae's a better win bet than he is a DFS play. Um, I could see that. Uh, Sungjae, Leishman, I like Matthew Fitzpatrick fine. Paul Casey, Joaquin Neiman. I mean, that's five names right there I'd be fine with in my in, in a cash game lineup almost. I am I want to dig deeper on Tony Fino at $9,800. Um, not for a cash game, but for tournaments. Um, you sent me like this Instagram video of Tony Fino like crushing it like 383. Yeah. which is pretty fun. And like, if we're going to get like angry feet now and angry Brooks trying to like re- come back on uh Bryson, I'm all here for it. Let's go. I already put in some, some, uh, I, I bet Tony Fino and like all the majors. I could. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> as soon as I saw that, I was like, Brandon's Instagram algorithm is undefeated. Uh, let's move to uh, another guy in this exact same range. It's Matt Kuchar. Not exactly Tony Finau uh, from, a, from a driving perspective, but he's $9,800, and we know that Kuchar, from an overall pure golf perspective, is a good golfer. So what are you viewing with Matt Kuchar this week at $9,800? So, you know, a lot of stars in the field. We probably want some balance to get like four five, potentially six big names as opposed to two or three big names and some long shots. So Kuchar at $9,800 is in that 
salary range where he could fit a balanced build. Um, he can fit any build really, depending on you know how exactly you go. But since 2013, Kucher's made uh, six or seven cuts at this uh, event with a win and six top 26 finishes overall. Did miss the cut here a year ago. Uh, was 39th here last week in a much less intimidating field. He was a negative in both ball striking stats off the tee and approach. It's a four round sample. We don't put a whole lot of stock into that, but Kucher, speaking of someone who's on a lot of rosters at a pretty high rate, I feel like Kucher, Brant Snedeker, and Tiger always get more love than they probably deserve. So I'm a little bit out on Kucher, even though I don't really play him a lot to begin with. So do you like Kucher? You skip him past him? No. What, are, what are you doing with him? <laughs> okay. Um, so Kucher is $9,800 in a tier that I was just slobbering all over. But uh, I have stroking out the T as one of my key stats. He's 114th in the field in that. Out of, again, like 135, and he's 84th in approach. So um, with my process, he doesn't sniff anywhere near like – what I want from my lineups, and again, it's a loaded tier. So I kind of hope he's popular. I'm not sure if he will be, given that, again, like we talked about, it is a really good tier, uh, which may just kind of like flatten everything out for everyone. Uh, but I have no interest in him at all, honestly. Um, and that's fine with me, because like, I, I again, I kind of hope he's popular. He's not getting a lot of buzz on Fanshare right now, which I just checked. He's actually, he's tied for 32nd, and tied with him is Dustin Johnson, who just dusted a field like a couple weeks ago. So uh, my interest in Dustin Johnson is kind of like, like I'm fully distracted from Matt Kuchar because I'm like, oh, I might be able to get DJ under the radar after he just obliterated. He took a, a flamethrower to a course like a couple weeks ago. So I've been distracted and I'm just going to ignore Matt Kuchar and obsess over Dustin Johnson instead. Yeah, so DJ is 15 to 1 on FanDuel Sportsbook to win. Uh, I guess we're just hijacking this Kucher conversation for yeah. DJ, but <laughs> I don't, yeah. I don't like the the win odds there. But yeah. if we find out that Dustin Johnson is just kind of ten percent owned, yeah, um, at eleven five, like he's the anti Sung Jay, where I think he's more interesting in DFS than to win bet. Whereas I think Sung Jay is a better win bet than a DFS play. I can get behind that. All right, let's talk here about a value play and Roy Sabatini and Sabatini. Doesn't fit the buy low approach uh, as far as golfers who were here last weekend. He finished 17th, but the knowledge of this course could make Sabatini a value play $8,900. The 17th place finish for Sabatini was his 13th time playing this course. He's missed one cut in the past 12 tries. He has played here, uh, and he has five top 20 finishes. Last week, specifically, Sabatini gained 3.6 strokes in approach, and that's good. The counter is that he also gained big time with his short game, and that's generally hard to duplicate. So I think Sabatini will be an option for me, Brandon, at $8,900, but that'll be more as a rotational piece than anything else. I don't think he's a core play for me or a staple. Does Sabatini do anything for you? Um, I mean, we've we've played a lot of Rory Sabatini yeah. for quite some time, uh, and the reason for that was because he was really good as a ball striker. Now... Over a long sample, that's kind of not the case anymore. His iron play has been, like, okay uh, the, in some of the past few events. At the Rocket Mortgage, it was terrible. But the the events that have really, like, boosted his approach play are kind of out of the sample that I really like to look at. So he's kind of just a guy uh, who wears some interesting shirts. Um, <laughs> he looked like I don't really. I don't really have – and again, this is someone that, that we've played like yeah. week in, week out. I just – I don't really see it anymore. Um, I'm fine bowing out, and I might cap my head-to-head -head lineups. Like I might I self-impose a salary floor at 9000 unless I punt with one, one pick, which gives me access to pretty much anything else I want to do. Is it Munoz again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> predictable he was ninth per round in strokes gained tee to green last week he just how missed many rounds did he play brandon two he Why was i think that? i have the stat he was like 29th in the full field in strokes gained tee to green despite playing two rounds yeah so why do you play two rounds 
because he missed the cut because <laughs> he can't, doesn't always putt. But he's not. He's not know, a terrible putter. He's not. He's not a Corey the, Connors guy where he's just spraying it. And Corey Connors is nine thousand. Like yeah. Corey Connors is not Sebastian Munoz. Don't get me. Don't confuse right. that. But like. I know don't, what you're don't saying. Don't trust Corey Connors. I know what you're great. saying. I'm just saying. I'm just rubbing it in a little bit because yeah. I think it's fun personally. Maybe oh, because be... yeah. Oh yeah. I, Corey Con- I've won three straight bobble hats. I'm allowed to talk smack, right? Three straight, you definitely didn't win like eight straight earlier this year. Three straight and five of seven. So I gotta, I gotta figure something out. No, you really don't. That's okay. Um, let's take a look at some current form here. Actually, before we do that, I should mention. Uh, I don't think I'm gonna cap it at. Uh, 9,000 for a floor. There are some golfers around 86, 87-ish who I like. Um, and I'm okay going... It's Lucas Glover. Um, <laughs> I'm okay with Lucas Glover and cash. We said some golfers that implied m- multiple. It did. One. I was lying. Uh, it's Lucas Glover. Uh, I'm okay with Lucas Glover and cash. And I think that that might be my floor for cash games. Um, I would... If I needed Eric Van Roy in 82, I would like kind of give it some consideration but i think for me it would probably be the 87 so we're not super far off there from a floor perspective i mean i I can get behind glover okay let's move on to current form talk about some golfers who have been good recently and nobody's i mean not many people have been better at least from a ball striking perspective than victor hovland if the dude could putt like, he'd win every event by, like, 16 strokes. That's just how disgusting he's been recently. But now he's 11-1 in a really tough field. And we know that the short game is not going to be a strength. But honestly, it doesn't matter at this point. Uh, what do you see with Hovland at 11-1? So, we're talking current form, and I actually didn't even know what exactly his finishes have been. Uh, but since the Schwab, 21st, 11th, 12th, and 3rd. The reason I don't really care about that is because finishing position is tied a lot to putting, but for Victor Hovland, it's pretty much exclusively the tee to green play. He's led the past three fields in strokes gained tee to green. That's insane. And if you if you gave me that, I would pay almost any price, frankly, it, for, for a DFS lineup. Uh, I know he's playing a lot, but He's young enough where I don't have to worry about that. He's actually been driving to to every event, so he doesn't have to drive this week. Uh, like, is look, he not like planes? or? I, I don't actually know the story. I kind of like the mystery around it. Yeah. Uh, so I'm No, fine I respect just, it Like, because road trips are fun. I, w- I, I would know, rather I, I drive like than fly. Yeah, yeah, I don't blame him, especially now. I, I don't want to be around people. <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's what it is, but I like the, myst- like the mystique of... I like Victor the Hovland idea of Victor Hovland like on the highway ripping off some beef jerky and listen to like cold play or something like that visual in my head makes me like him more i don't know why cold play i have no idea don't ask don't ask don't like just move probably on. like a hip-hop don't guy but uh <laughs> he was in the final trio last week didn't make it to the playoff um i'm not saying that anyone's going to forget about him but there are so many options where i don't think his draft rate is going to be prohibitively popular like this is like a dream golfer, uh, tee to green. We know that the putting isn't there, but he's the same price as Webb Simpson, who you can kind of say that this isn't a good fit for Webb Simpson, but Webb Simpson's an amazing iron player. Like Webb Simpson can kind of fit anywhere. Um, that's c- kind of the only like negative I have for Hovland is the price relative to everyone else. But I mean, there's no way you can tell me that he doesn't deserve to be priced where he is. So how are you handling Victor Hovland for the Memorial? Um, my question. Okay. So you were talking about the putting, like his bent grass numbers. It's a very, 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 very dangerous. It's like a 29 round sample. I think on bent grass, it's a very small sample and should not draw conclusions from that, but I'd rather he be neutral in a 29 round sample than bad. He's been neutral kind of actually above average. I think if I recall correctly, I'd rather have him there than actively bad. So I actually am not counting the the putting as an assumed negative for him this week. And when I do that, it's really easy to like him despite the salary. Would you rather have Morikawa or Hovland at their salary? Because I think I go Hovland personally. I think, which could be dumb, but I mean, you can't really go wrong, I guess. Yeah. No, you're, you can't go wrong, but I think I prefer Hovland. I like Hovland because he's a better driver. Yeah. 
that's probably the the only distinction. And I mean, more cows long term short game is not any it's not substantially better than right. Victor Hovland. So I think I would go Hovland there. And I'm actually okay, like we were talking about balance. I'm okay having lineups where Hovland's my most ex- my highest salary golfer. Like if I go Hovland Xander, that's gonna get me in that upper nine thousand range as often as I want to be there, and I like that a lot. So I think that although Hovland is high salaried and he is surrounded by good golfers, I'm still going to be in on him. I think, I think I, I kind of am okay just like keep going back to the well because like he hasn't given me a reason not to yet. So why not? Yeah, I mean, and he's doing it through the tee to green game. That's really all you want. And I think the most important takeaway for me this week is if if you basically I don't know it's like the top thirty or so of golfers ninety five hundred or above. If you take any of them and tell me that this guy's going to win, for the most part, right. like aside from a, maybe one or two names, I'd speak. Like, <laughs> I said 95. Sorry. Yeah. But like any of these golfers can win. And I think that it makes Seems a lot like of a sense. Challenge to me now. I need to find someone who you would say no. Fowler. I wouldn't be surprised if Ricky won. So like I want to get as many of those golfers as I can. Anywhere below that, I would Sergio be surprised. Garcia. He's so good tee to green, he just can't putt. I mean, don't worry. I'll, but, I'll work on this for the rest of the podcast. But you, and then you drop down to 94 and go down. Spieth, Billy Horschel, Kevin Stroman, Ian Poulter, Kevin Kisner, Adam Hadwin, Ben On, Doc Redman. I'd be surprised if any of those guys were. So. Wait, you said you would be surprised? Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought, like, let's let's be real. I think the true takeaway here is we listed Doc Redman in the same stratosphere as Jordan Spieth. I am into it. I will not push back on it at all. I love it. <laughs> all That's in, where baby. We are. All right. Let's talk about Bryson DeChambeau because Bryson has been the talk of the town ever since the end of the COVID-19 layoff. And back in the field this week, and he is the betting favorite. So let's talk some Bryson and how we're viewing him here. In the four events Bryson has played since play resumed, Bryson has gained at least 7.3 strokes tee to green three separate times. The other event, he gained just 4.2 tee to green, so still very good, and he's converted on that too. He has had finishes of third, eighth, sixth, and first. But there have also been some pop putting weeks in there, including gaining 12.8 total strokes putting in the past two events. And bentgrass is the worst surface for Bryson, so I was big on Bryson two weeks ago, and that definitely paid off, but... I may gravitate towards some of the other studs this week, potentially leaving myself underweight on Bryson DeChambeau this week, as scary as that could be. So, Brandon, how are you handling Bryson DeChambeau as the highest salary golfer in the field? I won't talk anyone out of him. I think that the the off the tee play being what it is, and again, it's not like he can only just launch it. He's hitting fairways, and he also knows when to club down and, and hit fairways when he when he needs to. He knows how to miss in the right spots, and that's a huge advantage. That raises his floor. I mean, that being said, I, I know that the, the, the shot tracker, shot link stuff is, like, skewed, but his iron play isn't as consistent as you kind of want it to be. It's been very good. I, I'm not trying to say that it's not, but he's okay around the greens, nothing amazing, and he's been putting really well. I don't think you have to play him and I'm okay. Just not really using him because at his price, you really have to start digging down into like that Jordan Spieth, doc Redman range. Yeah. And I don't know if the difference between Bryson and even John Rom is big enough to go from, I mean, I should have had this example pulled up, but like you can get like John Rom and, Abe answer or like Bryson right. and Spieth or something like that. And I know which one of those two I prefer. Same because I, I want to be in that upper 9,000 range as often as possible, which means I'm going to take every discount I can get. And even then the discount from Bryson to Rory McElroy at $200 is significant to me at least. Uh, like I'll take those $200 savings and go with Rory McElroy. So I mean, Rory's probably going to win this week anyway. <laughs> I mean, yeah, of course he has to. Um, but I think when I have so many good alternatives who are cheaper uh, but also have the same upside as Bryson, I am okay taking those savings. It's $500 down to Dustin Johnson, who I'm apparently now super into. Um, so I think that I'm just going to take those savings 
I think that Bryson's similar to Tiger, where if he burns me, he burns me. That's fine. I, I know that there is a decent chance that happens because Bryson's been crazy good. Tiger's won a couple tournaments. Uh, so that could happen, and that's okay. Uh, it's going to happen in golf pretty often. So I, I, I'm, I'm okay taking on that risk and ignoring them because I want the more the the lower salary and the other guys and I think that uh if it means I ignore Bryson in a week where he goes off so be it let's move on to your second current form golfer that's Daniel Berger and Berger if you were listening to this uh seven months ago and you had said he was 10-2 in a field that has this many good golfers you probably would have like laughed at someone but with the way the Berger has played recently it's justifiable uh so what do you see with Daniel Berger at 10-2 uh, entering this weekend so he's got six straight top 10 finishes. <clears throat> he has a win uh, since the hiatus at the Charles Schwab. Uh, just two starts since the, the return, but uh, he won and was third. Uh, overall, he's got some of the best, you know, quote unquote, recent form in the field. If you look back at the past 24 rounds, which does span back into like February, but he's eighth in strokes gained Tita Green. He's been a good ball striker, plus a good putter. Uh, I think that Putting sometimes is is something that we can gloss over and imagine that it it is completely unpredictable, but it's not. Uh, the data shows otherwise. It's not quite as important or as predictive as well. It's important in in a specific event, obviously, but it's right. not it's not as predictive as the ball striking stats, which is why you should prioritize TD Green play over putting. But he's got that. Like he can do kind of everything. Uh, his form at the Memorial hasn't been good, but I don't really care about that because he's a different golfer right now than he used to be. I think the recent form is just too hard to hate at 10 2 for Daniel Berger. So, uh, what are you thinking for Daniel Berger this week? Yeah, and he hasn't played the Memorial in like a long time. So, I can't even, I don't even care. I'm not, it's not even on my sheet what he's done here previously. Yeah. Um, and I know you weren't saying that. Um, but I think that. Burger is interesting because I think that if you look at like I love the upper ten thousand range, but like if for some reason I need like a, if I have ten five on the table, Burger would be a standout over Ricky Fowler. I like Gary Woodland, but like I would put Burger over Woodland pretty easily. Patrick Reed is always kind of interesting, but I put Burger over him too. So in that tier, I think that Burger is the number one golfer. I think the issue that I have is that I'm using a balanced approach in order to get to the upper 9,000 range more often rather than getting up to 10-2. So if I get there, I get there, and I would definitely go to Burger then, but I'm also not sure if I'm going to get there because I like the upper 9,000 range so much. Um, Like I'd rather go with Casey and Neiman than Burger and someone in the low 9,000s. And that could be a mistake because, again, I do like Burger quite a bit, uh, but I think just from a roster construction perspective, I'm, I'm going to gloss over him. But it's nothing against him or his game recently. So more so a roster construction question than Berger himself for me. Yeah, I mean, he fits easily uh, if you do the, I mean, if you if you punt with one option and punt not sure. in, just pick any random golfer, but you pick one of the probably five or six justifiable plays, like let's be real, in, in a field this good, there aren't many. Um, so if you do that, he fits in really well. I, th- I still think that if you're okay missing out on any of the top few golfers, you can still put him in in a lineup. And I think it makes a lot of sense. He might be underpriced for how good he's been, how consistent he's been. And I think that we can really kind of trust that this is a change. It's not just a recent hot stretch for him. Yeah. So I like Daniel Berger a lot at 10-2, uh, so long as I'm not struggling with – the rest of my lineup to get him in. I think that's a good way to phrase it. Um, so he's not a priority for you. Is that the, what you're saying? He, he might be because okay. I'm fine if he's like my second or th- cause I mean, if he's, if he's my second highest, like most expensive golfer, I'm going to have just about anything else I want to do. Right. So, I mean, he's probably realistically going to be third, but like, yeah, I'm fine with that because okay. I think that he's underpriced. Okay. Uh, if I can get back up there, I will. Uh, but I'm not going to prioritize him over some of the, the lesser expensive guys. I think that's the way that I'd phrase that. So we were talking about uh, the low 9,000 range not being all that intriguing. 
We could have a potential exception there in Doc Redman because he's back this week, uh, but this time he's not 10K. Instead, he is down the value range at $9,100, which means I think he's worth discussing again. In the four events Redman has played since the end of the layoff, he has gained at least 4.7 strokes in approach three separate times. He was at 2.4 in the other, and the off the tee play hasn't been as consistent as the approach play, but he did gain 4.4 off the tee in one event and gain 2.2 in another. And that gives him a path to upside when you add in how good the approach play has been. Redmond's sample on bent grass is small, and it's not great, but it's also not hideous. And he's in the same range as other heat check ball striking phase like Corey Connors, Scotty Scheffler. So I'm in on Redmond this week, Brandon. It sounds like you may not be. Uh, what's your view on him at $9,100? So he's played 11. He has, he has 11 starts in 2020. And how many of those do you think he's gained strokes around the green? I have no idea. Two. Yeah. He's gained in putting one, two, three, four, five. And he's uh-huh. actually gained at least three strokes putting in three of the past six. So, like, he's got... A, the, the around the green play is never good. But he has that kind of potential to gain enough strokes putting to have some upside the approach play is almost always good Uh off the tees kind of hit or miss a little bit more than i would like but right i think for the price if you're digging down he does what you need him to do to make sense in a field this good i'm not really okay spending down on golfers who only putt well because it's not going to be enough this week yeah i think that's correct um Redmond or Connors? Uh, Redmond is 91. Connors is 9,000. Redmond. I think that's where I'm at, too. Like, I, I don't just think believe Corey... in him a little more. Like, what? Yeah. I, I mean, believe like, in it. Yeah. And I think it's easier to see Redmond gaining in the areas where he is weak than it is to see Connors gaining in the areas where he is weak, if that okay. makes sense. So I mentioned that. Uh, Redmond's gained like three strokes putting in like three of the past six. Yeah. Uh, Has Corey Connors ever done that? He had like one. He did it at the Sony. He like seven. He he gained 5.1 at the Sony, but he's lost in two, four, six, eight, ten. So he's lost in nine of 11 starts in 2020. (laughs) Yeah. I mean. I'll go Redmond. I'd go Redmond. You mentioned Poulter as someone who did well last week and someone you recommended. I would go Redmond over Poulter as well at 93. Yeah. Okay, cool. We're on the same page there then. Let's take a look at what the betting markets are saying for this week. Bryson DeChambeau is a favorite at FanDuel Sportsbook. He is 10 to 1. Then you get to Justin Thomas at 12 to 1, Patrick Cantley at 13 to 1, and Rory McElroy at 14 to 1. And then Dustin Johnson is 15 to 1. Colin Morikawa and John Romer will 22 to 1 before we get to Hideki Matsuyama, Victor Holland, and Webb Simpson. They're all 25 to 1. Tiger Woods. 27 to 1. Brooks Kepka is 28, and Xander Schauffele rounds out the top group at 31 to 1. Brandon, we talked about a couple of studs so far, but from a DFS perspective, who is your number one golfer in this field this weekend? Uh, I think it's got to be Rory Agreed. for the price. Look, it's very easy to like Bryson for assuming what he can do. Uh, it's very easy to like Justin Thomas based on what he did here last week, but. Rory for as bad, quote unquote, bad as he's been. Everyone, everyone's kind of acting like he's like washed, <laughs> but he's like so consistent and so productive as a fantasy golfer, which is kind of its own thing from winning and converting on wins. Obviously, if you're spending this much at eleven eight, you want a win. Let's not pretend like Rory can't win this event. That's like silly, but it kind of seems like everyone's like, yeah, he's not going to win any of these anymore. I could be reading too much into that, but it really seems like people are just not thinking about Rory enough. Um, So Rory is my number one because he's such a good tee to green player. And I know that he won't gain as many yards off the tee as Bryson, but give me like Rory from like 150 versus Bryson from like 110. I still might just prefer Rory right now. I just haven't seen enough from Bryson like around the greens to believe that he's going to get out of trouble as much as he might need. Well, I think it goes back to the Morikawa discussion that you were talking about at the beginning, where like we've seen that we should discount what we've seen in small samples. 
and Rory's appro- approach play in the small sample hasn't been great. But even with the approach play not being as good as it has been previously, he still finished well because he has so many areas where he can win. And like that to me says massive floor. And if the approach play comes back to anywhere near where it was, massive ceiling. So I think that that's why I also have Rory at the top of my list is because the floor is there. The ceiling is there. Like if his approach play is off again, he can still make that cut and he's not going to kill your lineup. Um it's not going to win you a tournament, but like maybe you can still cash with him. Uh, and if he does click with the approach play, he could win this in in a crazy good field. I mean, I mean, like if Bryson didn't lead the Rocket Mortgage in putting, he wasn't going to win. Like, right. I get that. Yeah, he putted well and he won, and that's nothing we take away from him. But to think that Bryson in this field is the must play because he won the Rocket Mortgage is the wrong way to think about it. I he agree. is a very easy play to justify because of what he does off the tee and because he is good with approach, even though I prefer some other golfers at the top. So it's fine to play Bryson. It's definitely fine to play just Thomas, but I prefer Rory. If we're talking about second, since we both agree on Rory and a green's no fun, I might go DJ second. Is that stupid? I'm, I'm not there um, with DJ and I, I, I was on him for yeah. his win. Yeah. What I saw from him was he's going to gain strokes off the tee and kind of keep himself in. And that week, too, he was like 30 to 1 um, on yeah. FanDuel Sportsbook whenever we were discussing it. So I don't know if DJ's the right fit this week. Like his long term form over the past 50 rounds is probably the worst of any golfer above like 10 5, even. And he can get really hot, and I'm un- I-, I understand that, but I would rather play John Rahm. I'd rather play Patrick Cantlay. So if I'm looking for the number two, let's should we cut off Bryson and, and JT? Because I think they're all probably like sure. 1A, 1B, 1C. Um, I would look next to possibly Victor Hovland. Okay. I'm going to go DJ. Um, six strokes in approach at uh, the Travelers. 3.1 at the RBC Heritage. And the biggest issue with his long-term fo- form has been the approach play because he's 10th in strokes off the tee, even in that Where did he do sample. off the tee? He gained nothing in the Travelers. Yeah, that, and that's the thing. Like, but he's 10th over 50 rounds. I know. It just so, was, like, it's, it's insane. And he gained like, 5.4 was... off the tee the week before that, uh, 3.1 in approach. So, you know, I think that if I look at the long-term sample, I like his off-the-tee play. and the short-term sample, I like his approach. Maybe the approach regresses because he was really, really bad before that. But I don't know. I think if people are going to be off of him, despite having really good performances recently, then I'll be in on him. I think playing Dustin Johnson on FanDuel at a very low draft percentage is a very easy play to talk yourself into. Betting him at fifteen to one on Fanduel no, Sportsbook yeah, yeah. is not. I'm but, not... And, and I think I'm ha- I'm having some of that trickle in, right? But I mean, I'm, I'm fine. If, if I'm going to bet, I'm just going to go Rory. Yeah, that like, without Rory, a yeah. doubt. So if you're betting a favorite, it, it would be Rory for me yeah. easily. We kind of talked about this before, but with so many just absolute bangers in this field, are you are you just going balanced rosters? For the, is that your default build this weekend? It has to be, especially like once I once we did the. 95 and up like if yeah. i have to play mark leishman sung J M, and paul casey because i can like roster who like daniel berger xander and like hovland or something i'm fine with that because this field really drops off to me at 9400 and, and down and yes if you roster lucas glover and he finishes 20th again and it saves you a lot of salary and you can spend up for bryson and he runs away with it or whatever Yes, that's that's a good process, but the cut odds for these guys really drops off. The win equity really drops off. So I think if I'm building one lineup, I'm really encouraged by the balance. Although if I just plug in Sebastian Munoz and pray that he makes the cut and is good enough to the green, I can do almost anything, and that's encouraging. But I think if if I had to say right now, I'm probably not going to do that, and I'm going to try to cap it at, at 9,000 with potentially Harris English or Doc Redman. And then go balance from there. 
If you if you do Eric Van Roy at eighty, I don't know if you're I don't know if you're in on Eric Van Roy. And I am. I always love Eric Van Roy. Okay, but so he's eighty two. I, I can't recommend him anymore because he's just ruined everything. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> he's eighty two. If you plug him in, I can fill a lineup that that brings me the the greatest joy I have experienced in this entire quarantine. That's probably hyperbolic, um, but the lineup that I can make with Eric Van Roy in there. I get to pepper that upper 9,000 range. I get to use a couple of studs I like a lot. That's pretty fun. So I think that I'm on board with the one lower salary play, not Munoz, um, one lower salary play, and then kind of a mixed, uh, a more balanced approach from there. I think that is going to be my go-to build for this week. I mean, it makes a lot of sense because, again, None of these golfers who are 95 or above are guaranteed to make the cut. And you can kind of say that any week and be like, well, why don't you just play all the $7,000 guys because they'll be low owned. Like, you can nit- like nitpick that conversation. But right. one of these golfers down here making the cut and you really have a, a process for it, someone who's really good tee to green, to unlock pretty much five world-class golfers, like elite golfers, is it's just a very simple decision and that is what i'm using against you in the bobble hat this week so good luck uh which golfers have had odds that have shifted since things opened i think the only golfer whose odds have lengthened is tiger from 25 to 27 on fandle sportsbook which was i think noteworthy uh but some golfers whose odds have shortened patrick cantley from 15 to 13 dustin johnson from 17 to 15 xander shoffley from 33 to 31 gary woodland I mean, I I think I know he wasn't I know he wasn't 33 at your book to begin with, but <laughs> um, Gary Wildman 45 to 37, Abraham Answer 50 to 42, Jason Day and Tony Finau 65 to 55, Kevin Streelman 75 to 65, Joaquin Neiman 75 to 70, and then Byung Hoon on from 120 to 100. So we talked about Kevin Streelman entering last week as someone who had good course history and had come off a second place finish. And then he finished seventh last week. He's $9,300 and it's in a tier we don't like. I'm still not super drawn towards Kevin Streelman. So I'm guessing the betting odds is just like a course history play. I'm not in on him. uh, But is that something that you are gravitating towards or no? I mean, he's 32nd in strokes gained off the tee, 29th in approach over the past 50 rounds uh, because he's going to hit fairways here. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the, I, don't, I don't know. I feel like my spreadsheet's wrong, but I guess according to Fantasy National, over the past fifty rounds, he's one hundred and thirty second in par three scoring, but second in par five scoring. All right. Um. Yeah, the, I'm sure. Well, it's the, probably because par threes are more centered around short game, and his like short putting? game is not good. Yeah, I, I just mean, I, I wonder if like if they adjusted for field strength, what his yeah. par five scoring would be. But yeah. I don't, I don't hate it. Yeah, I had, I wasn't really drawn towards him because, like, again, the guys right above him are so good. But I don't know. it's, I mean, it's that, it's that like situation. Am I good with Kevin Stroman at ninety three, or do I find a way to get two hundred dollars to get to Mark Leishman or, or Sung JM? or 300 to Paul Casey. Right. Uh, which lower salary golfers have odds to stand out to you? Uh, none. So, <laughs> um, uh, to, to kind of give anyone with relatively short odds, I have to make it like 9,500 or below. We have yeah. some GM and Kevin Stroman, both at 65 to one, Jordan Spieth, 70 to one, Billy Horschel, Billy Horschel and Mark Leishman, uh, 75, uh, Ben on is a hundred to one. So is Kevin Kisner, Adam Hadwin's one ten. Ian Poulter's 120, but there are only two golfers below 9,000 on FanDuel and who have odds better than 150 to 1 to win on FanDuel Sportsbook, and that's Sepp Straka at 130. Uh, he's 8,500, and Shane Lowry at 140, who is 8,900. So if your process involves kind of matching up odds, win odds and salary, going to be a little bit of a tough week. Um, although, I mean, Sung JM at 6,500, or yeah, 65 to 1 and, and 9,500 would help out a lot. Yeah um yeah it's 
it's weird. Like, it's weird to recommend golfers who are 250 to 1 to win. But, like, I feel like that's kind of something we just have to embrace this week because the field is so good. You don't These have lower to. End... What? Like, you don't have like you don't have to risk it all on Sam. As much 80, as I love Sepp Straka. A guy doesn't like, need to win at $8,200. No, he doesn't. Yeah. He needs to make the cut. Yeah. What 40%. are your Van Royen's cut odds? Uh, probably a lot higher than anywhere else because I his T degree games very very good. Huh. Um, I have him at fifty eight percent, which is significantly higher than anyone else in this range, this price range. So, huh. well, look, look, I play probably more EVR than anybody. Just saying, just saying, it's the joggers. TTP. TTP, baby. Uh, weather for this weekend, things are going to be kind of windy, actually, on Thursday. Uh, winds will start around 9 miles per hour, but will increase to 15 miles per hour by noon. The golfers in the early wave will have a slight advantage, uh, but everybody's going to deal with some kind of wind there. No wind at all on Friday. So I do think there is some credence to stacking early tee times on Thursday and hoping the wind gets wild on Thursday afternoon. I don't think it's a must. But it's an option. The wind is pretty calm Saturday before it picks back up throughout the day on Sunday. So it'll be around 13 miles per hour when the final group is rounding up on Sunday. I don't think you need to look at wind splits uh, necessarily because I don't think it's high enough for that. But there is at least some thought to giving preference to golfers teeing off earlier Thursday. That's what I would say about the weather for this weekend. But let's dive into our player picks for the Memorial Tournament, starting off in the upper range. Brandon, who stands out to you on FanDuel for this weekend? So Rory's my number one. I don't think you can go wrong with pretty much anyone in the top, but I'm also okay if I start my lineups off salary-wise with Victor Hovland at 11-1. You couldn't really design a better daily fantasy profile than what Victor Hovland's given us uh, with the, the amazing TD green play. He's always in position for birdies. He's just so good uh, at ball striking that the floor is elevated. Uh, the chipping is still a little bit problematic. And uh, I mean, one of the reasons I don't like to watch as much golf as I think uh, some other, I mean, I watch a lot of golf, but you know, when you see him chip from the rough and stay in the rough, you yeah. think that he still can't chip chip. He it's holds not good out for your nerves. That. He holds out after that, but like, I mean, which which is it? Um, either way, I'm fine. Like I said, starting my lineups with Hovland if I have to. I think we can do a lot worse. Um, I'm not worried. Obviously, we don't have to worry about the travel. Um, but again, we can't really go wrong uh, with any of the top tier. And I think I would rank the top: Rory, JT, Bryson, Cantlay. I go Rory one, DJ two. I'm just gonna double down. Let's do it. Um, maybe the no travel's a negative for Hovland. Like maybe he like gets some juice out of these like road trips. I don't know. If well, if he doesn't do well, if he so. doesn't do well, it's going to be because he didn't drive the car. Exactly. There are no other conclusions to be formed. So <laughs> just, you know, make sure you check back on this. Uh, my favorite high salary guy is Rory McIlroy because the form since the end of the layoff has been okay. But I think with all the shiny objects at the top end of the salary pool, we could get a situation where Rory might not be as popular as usual, and that's a good thing. The main blemish for Rory has been his approach play since the end of the layoff, and he's actually down a tenth of a stroke there in three events, but he's making up for it uh, because he's making up ground off the tee. He has been lights out around the green, which is kind of what Rory does, and that could make his finishes unsustainable given that around the tee play is not as uh, sticky, but the flip side is that if he gets his approach play back on track, he could go back to dominating. So even with the recent struggles, Rory is 21st in the field in approach the past 50 rounds. He is third off the tee. He is 17th in scrambling. So I am going to actively try to be overweight on Rory McIlroy at $11,800. I don't think he is a must play for cash games because I don't think anybody is really a must play for cash games in such a good event. But I think he's someone I'm probably going to use in cash games. Uh, what's your evaluation on Rory? Um, I think based on what he can do, T to green, and even though he's not the best putter, he's not an abysmal putter. Um, I think that gives him the highest floor over the long term. Nobody scores more uh, Fanduel points compared to the field that he plays in than Rory. More cow is actually second. Um, I, I don't think that Rory will command quite the attention that he deserves with Bryson and, and JT there. So. For me, it's Rory uh, number one this week. I feel good. You can never really feel bad about plugging in Rory McIlroy. All right. Who else do you like in this upper range? 
Um, just about everyone. So I'm okay saying Daniel Berger at 10-2 and really honing in on him because I think he's underpriced. And if you're okay playing guys like Daniel Berger, you can spend up for a third, fourth stud, depending on what you do with the the rest of your lineup. Uh, someone like Xander. I didn't really mention John Rahm, but I think he's a great win bet, a bounce back. Um, played pretty well on the weekend um, last week. I think everyone's just over John Rahm, and that's the kind of spot that we should probably dive back in on. But Daniel Berger, not, not someone I've really played a lot. Uh, that's been bad because he's been so good with those six straight top tens. But he's really good. Like I said, I, I talked about it already, but the T to green game has been really good. And the putter has been helping him reach high end, but also it's a good thing to be a good putter. And I right. think that sometimes we look at good putting and say, well, he's bound to regress he can still regress to his baseline, which is probably just a plus putter. Yeah. So that's the difference. So uh, under 10 and under 10, five, I think Berger just opens up so much and it just really gives a lot of credence to a balanced lineup. Like regression is not to zero strokes gain putting regression is back to their, like their true talent level. And, and it's also it's, not, yeah, it's not, ne- it's not regression to negative. Right. Exactly. I mean, unless you're in court college. Well, <laughs> but but like, for John yeah. Robb, I know what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. But then I had sad thoughts about every golfer we like. Except for Xander Shavale, because Xander is a good putter. Uh, Xander is my second high-salary guy, and he did struggle off the tee last week. And part of his 14th place finish was good putting, but the longer sample on Xander says we should be ecstatic about using him at 10-8. Xander ranks 19th or better in all four of the key stats I'm looking at for this week. Justin Thomas is the only other guy who ranks in the top 20 and even three of those stats, and Xander does it in all four. And last year at the Memorial at this exact same course, uh, Xander gained 4.7 strokes off the tee and 1.5 around the green. So although he didn't do well in those categories this past week, he can beast out in those categories at this exact same course. So I think Xander is like $500-ish underpriced uh, for this event at 10.8. So he might be the guy... I turn to most often of any golfer in this entire field. I know that might be a bit hyperbolic or might be overboard given that I do like some guys who are cheaper. Maybe I should make them my core plays and rotate in these studs, but I just think he's underpriced. Uh, what is your evaluation of your boy, Xander Schauffele? Yeah, I mean, at 31-1, to 1, there might not be a better win pick on FanDuel Sportsbook than, than Xander. Um, according to Data Golf, uh, in this field, he's... I think 14th in adjusted strokes gain approach in 2020 and ninth off the tee, which like, think about that, this field adjusting for the, 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 you know, the fields that these guys play. And that's insane. He is very underrated and yes, he's not always in contention, which is scary because I track Xander more than any other golfer. So like, I'm always aware of like where he is, but uh, I think he's a great DFS play. I think he's a great win bet. Uh, and I really have no issues uh, with Xander. Um, I'm going to go back to him. All righty. Let's move down to the mid-range then. Who stands out to you there? Abraham Answer at 99. Uh, I think that uh, he kind of fits that, like, we've forgotten about Abe Answer. They have it on Fanshare. I'll tell you that. Uh, okay. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, well, that's surprising. I mean, it's warranted. Um, He's tied for first with Tiger. Oh, wow. Okay. I, th- I think for- it's justified just saying that, but I'm just letting you know. In general, Abe yeah. Answer's not been right. at the forefront of everyone's mind, but it's a really good price for someone who's top 17 off the tee and in approach over the past 50 rounds. He was like that can't fade a few weeks ago, and that's always silly for someone who's, for as good as Abe Answer is, he's not Bryson. Like, he's yeah. not, like, it's different. Um, but Answer's finished top 14 in three straight starts since the return uh, because of really good iron play. He's really accurate. He's a really good driver, and I think people don't really think about that. He could probably be like 10-3, 10-4 in this field, and that would make sense. Uh, but for, for 99, I think that uh, Abe Answer is a standout play. I think he's a cash game play for sure. Um, I think he's a good play for tournaments. I have no objections to Abraham Answer. I think he's awesome. Um, it's another reason why this tier is good. So let's talk about Joaquin Neiman also in this range. Neiman played decently, decently well last week at this course, but... Not enough to gain attention from the public, which I think is a good thing for if we're talking about DFS because we don't want to be popular. Neiman probably won't get that. Uh, he gained 1.4 strokes off the tee and 4.1 on approach. 
just lost around the green to push him down to a 31st place finish, which is actually the worst finish Neiman has had at Muirfield. He was 6th in the Memorial in 2018, 27th last year, and then 31st this past weekend. And altogether, Neiman ranks 28th off the tee. He's 15th in approach, and that's in addition to being actually a plus putter on bent grass. So at $9,700, Neiman... Not my favorite golfer in this tier. Uh, it's Paul Casey, and we'll talk about more more about him in a second. But I think that Neiman is another name to add to this list. It's it's Answer, it's Neiman, it's Casey, it's Leishman. I think Finau is interesting too. Uh, there are a lot of good names here. Where does Neiman stack up for you in this range? Um, he might be third okay. for me behind Answer and Sungjae. Okay. Um, but I mean, he was 18th in approach last week. His only struggle was really around the green. Um, and I think we can probably buy into the, the idea that Neiman's baseline as a putter, at least on bent grass, is close to zero. Yeah, like I'll take it. It's that. not wildly negative, and that's yeah. what we've wanted for a long time. Uh, he virtually never, ever, ever loses approach strokes, and that is something that gives him a floor and ceiling. So for 97, he's just another golfer who fits the balance build, seems safe, as safe as can be. Uh, for someone priced here who's not elite. So Neiman, I would think third for me in this range. Okay, I think I'd put him second behind Casey. Uh, talk about Sung JM, someone you had higher on your list than Neiman. Yeah, so $200 savings uh, from Neiman, uh, and technically better win odds on, on FanDuel Sportsbook. The current form, pretty spotty. I get that. That's why his price is low um, on really both sport FanDuel Sportsbook and FanDuel. But M won the Honda Classic, was third at the Arnold Palmer, uh, you know, February into March. Since that return, finished 10th at the Charles Schwab, but then everything kind of just went into the dumpster. I missed the cut at the RBC Heritage, 58th at the Travelers, 53rd at the Rocket Mortgage, 63rd last week at the, the Workday Charity Open. Hasn't gained approach strokes in any of the past four, but gained off the tee in three of them. We've actually, I went back, and it's not that uncommon for someone as good as Sungjae like and specifically for Sungjae, he's had some like cold streaks with the irons, and it will snap back all of a sudden. It's very hard to predict, but at 95 in this field, I think that that's the right kind of chance to take because you could, if we find out that Sungjae is just forgotten about, um, he's 25th in fan share tags. That's going to be enough where he's not drafted on enough teams to to care about significantly. So I think the upside's there uh, okay. for me. Yeah, I think, um, like I said, I'm there from a win bet perspective. The reason that I'm a bit colder from a DFS perspective is that, like, if I bet him to win and he stinks, he burns that one ticket. But if I have him in DFS and he stinks and I have five other guys who hit, that's concerning. Um, so with the, the approach play being colder, I am more okay betting him to win than I am for DFS. I think that I'm still going to get him in DFS because – like, the odds he gets a top 10 are better than a lot of guys in this range. But the ed's, odds he misses the cut may, may also be higher. I mean, not in your simulations, but, like, yeah, yeah. realistically. No, get, it's so. just it's crazy to think how good Sungjae is and has been, and now we're like, we can't really trust the guy. After I can't back. trust him at, at times. But he's not going to be a core play for me, whereas Joaquin Neiman, Paul Casey will be. If that makes sense. It does, yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about Paul Casey. I've mentioned him several times as being my favorite guy in what is a loaded range. And it's hard to settle on just a couple of guys like, but I think that Casey is at the top of the list for me because he's someone who stands out both with his ball striking and his putting. He ranks eighth in strokes gain off the tee and sixth in approach. And Bankgrass is the best putting surface for Paul Casey. He is 25th there over the past 100 rounds. And Casey doesn't have any recent history on Weirfield, but... He's played here six times before, so he knows the course. Most recent was 2016, and he did miss the cut there, but he has all the tools necessary for a top 10 finish, so I am good labeling Casey as my favorite golfer in this tier. He didn't make that list for you, Brandon. What pushed you off of Paul Casey? Uh, partially that you had him written up. Oh. <laughs> um, I thought you listed like M as like your favorite guy this tier, though. Yeah, so oh. M... I like I like M Neiman and answer more. Okay. Uh, the thing that pushes me off Casey is the uncertainty. Sure. I don't think that Paul Casey needs to golf every week or every other week to feel like we know what Paul Casey is. He's very good. Uh, TD Green. The if you want to talk about win equity, like 
it's there statistically. Yeah. The conversion is not always quite right. there. I think that there's some safety, but he's like the putting can be bad enough where I don't feel particularly safe with him. Sure. And I would kind of think that Sung Jay's T to green game is makes me like him more. That's fair. Uh, Casey's not great around the green, so I, I think that's like fair. And Sung Jay is so like I, I mean, generally. Um, so I get it. Um, I just like Casey more. I think that the ball striking has been so good for such a long sample. It was not bad in his first event back from the COVID-19 layoff. Uh, so that's not a negative. So I think that's why I wind up going there. And then Casey's a cash game play and a core play for me in tournaments too. Look, he's, he's a really underrated driver uh, of the ball with, with a combination of distance and accuracy. He's going to probably hit a lot of greens in regulation. It's just, it just comes down to whether he makes the putts. I like Paul Casey a lot, and he's just, a, again, another reason why I like such a balanced lineup this week. All right, let's move down. If you do have to force yourself to roster some cheaper golfers, who will you use when you have to do that? Um, I think Doc Redman's interesting, but it's, we usually cap this at like 9,000. I think there's someone at 9,000 who's interesting. That's Harris English. Uh, he's finished top 20 in five of six uh, starts, the exception being a missed cut at the Charles Schwab. Uh, he ranks only 62nd in long-term approach play, but has gained there uh, three of the past four before he tested positive for COVID. There are holes in his game, which is why I don't really want to recommend too many uh, inexpensive golfers this week because they all have issues. Um, but at 9,000, I think he stands out in this field kind of a lot compared to anyone else really in this range yeah i almost had harris english my player picks um so i'm on board with him nine thousand dollars checks a lot of boxes which is hard to do like we talked about how everyone um in this range has to have a, a glaring hole like you said he has holes but like he's not hideous anywhere and i think that's a good thing um at least based on what i have so i think that yeah. that english is imp- someone i will use for sure I mean, if this course plays tough, he's sixth in bogey avoidance. Mm-hmm. He's fourth in this field in greens and regulation gained. Again, not that not, those aren't adjusted for right. the fields that they're playing in, but that's still pretty good. I agree. Uh, my first lower salary golfer is Lucas Glover, and it's kind of just a given that Glover's short game is going to be an issue, but his approach play has been so bonkers recently, ever since play resumed, that it hasn't mattered. He has gained at least five strokes in approach in three of four events since the end of the layoff. He gained three in the other. Even though Glover has lost strokes around the green in all four of those events, and he has lost strokes putting in two, he's still in a top 25 finish each time. That's how good the approach play has been for Lucas Glover. He is 34th in strokes, 35th in strokes gained off the tee. He's going to strike the ball well. If he can just stumble into a couple of good putts, he's got some pretty big juice for 87. So I know it may seem like his ceiling is a top 25 finish, but if he happens to have a good week around the green, I think everything else is so good where he could have more upside than that. So I understand the reservation, but I don't think it's entirely something that should push us off of it. If he ha- I mean, it's around the green play isn't just something that you kind of lock into. Right. Um, he almost never gains there. And... While we still want the recipe to be approach play number one and then like off the tee, give yourself a chance to make some putts. We see golfers not like these golfers who are amazing ball strikers have lukewarm approach play for like a round or two and their putting can't save them. And then they miss the cut. And I think a lot of these golfers who make the cut can separate and kind of climb by putting themselves in into position a lot. I think this week we don't have to take the risk as much. So while I don't hate Lucas Glover, I just, I, I really think that I don't want to have to dig down here. I mean, I don't know why you're not assuming that he's going to gain 16 strokes and approach again. It's not going to matter, you know? If he does, if he doesn't, like if he's like, okay, he might easily miss the cut because the yeah, round, but so like, can everyone else at eighty seven hundred dollars, and his baseline is higher from the from those. But perspectives. you don't have to play anyone at eighty seven, and still, and you can still feel like an amazing lineup. Yeah. And a lot of different variations of lineups. I'm going to. Look, okay, so we're both good with the idea of one cheap option. Yeah. Why not Sebastian Munoz? 
Because Lucas Glover is better? <laughs> he is $7,300. So $1,400 in savings, which is the difference between... No, no, don't do that. No, 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 no. <laughs> someone's 11 for John Rom and Patrick Reed. Pat Reed straight up. Abe <laughs> answer straight up over John Rom. <laughs> but Munoz, okay. 450 to 1 to win. I'm not recommending to bet him to win, although I have a lot of futures on Munoz. <laughs> This seemed pretty dead, but Munoz missed the cut last week, and he just got tanked to the bottom of the the salary pool. I mentioned this already, but he's 29th in overall strokes gained tee to green through two rounds compared to everyone else's four rounds. Per round, he was ninth in tee to green uh, among golfers last week. He lost 4.4 strokes putting to miss the cut. He's not a great putter, but he doesn't always. He's not quite as abysmal as that would seem. I think that if you're punting with one play, Munoz makes sense. I did it with Carlos Ortiz last week. He made the cut, but Joel Damon didn't. <laughs> um, and Justin Rose was a train wreck. But I like the idea this week of either a six-man balanced lineup or spend down with one spot rather than spending down with like two or three. I don't think that's the right play this week. Yeah. Um, so I have six finishes on my sheet for the six most recent tournaments, just so I can see... Finishes, I know you dive in deeper after that. Right. Munoz is past six. Cut, cut, cut. 28, cut, cut. Yeah. Sounds like a, I'm barking out like a, a football, like cadence. Yeah. Nah. I've used Munoz a lot of those times he's been cut. So, like, I'm generally in. But at some point, you got to make the cut. Yeah, you do. So, I'm going to go Glover instead. I'll pay the 1400 to get to Glover. Okay. I mean, look, I'm not going to fight anyone. Sure. And I'm I'm really only recommending this in small doses. But sure. for how good he, he he was, Tita Green last week, he easily could have made the cut, and he, he would have been. Pro- I think he was like 83 last week. Yeah. Something like that. Ortiz is 79. I think that Munoz is 83. I believe. Ortiz was 76. Oh, okay. Yeah. Close enough. Whatever. Either, oh no. Either way. It was Sung Yul No, who is 79, who I'm pretty sure missed the cut. I didn't use him, but I had him on my like tracking thing because I was curious. Didn't do anything. So uh, my lower salary guy who I want to use as a you know punting option is Eric Van Royen. Not as cheap as Munoz, but I like what he does more. Because if I want to live in that mid nine thousand range, I've got to you know find someone super cheap unless I'm going super balanced. I think that Eric Van Royen fits that. He's eighty two hundred dollars, and that's because his win odds are all the way out at two fifty to one. Probably not going to win it, kind of like Munoz, but he can make a cut and push for a top 20. Van Royen's approach play has not been great in three events since play resumed, but it hasn't been bad enough to ignore that he's 35th in the field and approached the past 50 rounds. He is also 23rd off the tee, and we've seen Van Royen light it up against really good fields in the not-so-distant past. So I am down to buy him $8,200. I think that Van Royen fits that really well. Are you still going to use him or... Has he burned you too many times? Um, I think he's tempting. I mean, he was eighth at the PGA last year. Um, he was in contention at the WGC Mexico, and he finished third. He, he just doesn't putt. Yeah. And at a certain point, I mean, you want to talk about Sebastian Munoz's finishes uh, for Van Royen since his third cut. Oh, it's cut 58 or something like that. Cut, cut, 21st cut. Yeah. And it's because he just hasn't putted. Yeah. I mean, his irons haven't been great, but... You're you're embracing a lot of risk down in this range, um, and you could be embracing risk with Eric Van Royen. Have him make the cut, finish 25th, but you really wanted to jam in like take a take, you know take your pick of a, of an expensive golfer, Hideki, uh, Brooks, Tiger, and like those guys can still miss the cut. Yeah. So I feel like the the right play is to minimize the amount of times that you really spend down on golfers who are like. 40 percent likely to make the cut but you said vendor Royen's 58 so we're I, we're li- swimming in money baby that's the long term yeah that's the long term uh-huh yeah no that's 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 fact see the simulations are only fact when i want them to be fact i just want you to know that yeah I got you. uh win picks for this week we're gonna go one at 60 to one or longer one i'm gonna include any anybody you want at the top end because i think it's a good enough field where we can do that um i won the bobble hat so i get to pick 60 to one or longer i could be a dick and pick Sung Jay, but I'm gonna pick Joaquin Neiman at seventy to one. I'll let you have your Sung Jay. That's okay. I like Neiman more. Actually, I like Paul Casey more. Yeah, just kidding. 
Yeah, no, sorry. I need to stick with what I said. Paul Casey, 75 to 1. He is my win pick of the longer guys. Yeah, Casey's actually first among those guys in, in win odds in my Sims. So okay. good pick. Good job. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, so if I can go anyone, I'll go with Rory. Okay. Although I think some really good bets include John Rahm and Xander. Yeah. Um, I would agree. Depending on what the number is, because Xander's 20 some places in like. Yeah. That's true. It's enough That's to true. make me think. It, he's 31 on FanDuel Sportsbook. This is why you bet FanDuel Sportsbook, baby. Um, That's right. Okay, who do you have for your long person? Sungjae. Long boy. Sungjae? Okay. <laughs> Sungjae long boy. It's a term we use boy. in MLB DFS for, like, if there's an opener. Um, anyway, long boy. Um, I think I'll go JT. I know I mentioned I like DJ more than JT. But when it actually comes down to it, I'm picking JT. <laughs> um, Justin You're picking Thomas, win picks. I mean, yeah, fifteenth off the tee, second in approach, sixth in scrambling. Like, what? What more do you want? Uh, so, if I can go just straight up with no salaries, no odds tied to it, I'll go JT over the other ones. If I can't ever worry, which I can't. Yeah, um, it could be silly not to pick Bryson, but yeah, I think all things considered, I, I, I have Rory uh, number one. Yeah. So I'm going to stick with it. So you have Rory and Sungjae. I have JT and Paul Casey. I feel like I've picked that combo several times. I don't know how far back your win pick spreadsheet goes, but I've definitely picked that exact combination at some point in the past. I was actually trying to find it because both names populated when I was typing them in. Yeah, so it's definitely happened at some point. Uh, any final thoughts for you, Brandon, before we close up for this week? Uh, you need to get 6 of 6 to make a run at the top of a tournament. Um more golfers will make the cut, so it might feel like you can take more chances. I think there's merit to that, but in the same breath, you're not guaranteed that your stars make it. So I think by raising your lineup's floor, you actually have a significantly better chance of getting six of six through, even if the optimization doesn't actually work out that way. Yeah. I saw Max Homa like apologizing because he didn't get lineups to six of six, and like, amazing. <laughs> Um, so yeah. bless you, Max Homa. Um, but yeah, I think getting six of sixes is, is, is key, which is why I know that I was talking about Lucas Glover and Eric Van Royen, but I am okay with a balanced approach where you, your floor is 9,091, like a Harris English or Doc Redmond type. Uh, but I'm also okay dropping down for one. This is not a week though, where I'm going to have multiple golfers below $9,000 in the same lineup. I don't think that this is the kind of week for that personally. I think that's the number one takeaway. All righty. That is all that we have for today. And that's all we got for a couple of weeks now. Brandon, I appreciate it. Uh, good luck to you this weekend. Uh, where can people find you on Twitter? I'm at Gadula13, G-D-U-L-A-1-3. And I am at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Make sure you are subscribed to get uh, the solo podcast of Brandon next week. The solo podcast, me the week after that, et cetera, et cetera. NASCAR podcasts, maybe some more UFC podcasts. And the solo shot coming back for MLB DFS not too far down the line. Make sure you are subscribed to the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed wherever you listen to your podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for on the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Good luck with your lineups for the memorial. We'll talk to you again in the very near future. This has been the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast, powered by number five.